This video is about antitrust law and why I nerd out about it. My favorite class in law school was antitrust law, and it wasn't actually because of antitrust law. Granted, the idea of retaining competition and preserving the marketplace is something that is interesting to me, but that's not actually why I like antitrust law. The reason why I like it is because of the way that it is structured. There is an administrative law around antitrust law that works in a different manner. And it happens because Congress wrote the most abominably badly written law possible when they put together the Sherman Act, which created the antitrust law in the United States. Now, during the robber baron era, uh, there was tremendous public pressure to create a law against monopolies and Congress obliged and created the Sherman Act. But the Sherman Act, as written, cannot be applied. It is inconsistent with itself. It declares that, and this is going to be a paraphrase from memory, that all uh, restraints, all agreements in restraint of trade are hereby per se illegal. And it lists out some punishments for that, for violations of that law. Now, an agreement in restraint of trade is awfully broad. That can include things like a partnership agreement or an exclusive buying contract. In other words, a lot of very legal and even encouraged behavior. That is just part of the way the economy runs and it's not unfair to anybody and it's just the way things operate. When the first case was brought under this law against Standard Oil, the Supreme Court of the United States had a challenge. How do you apply a law written that badly that if you applied it literally, it would declare all kinds of totally harmless activity illegal. They added a word. In their interpretation of that law, they added the word unreasonable. Every unreasonable restraint of trade, every uh, agreement, every unreasonable agreement in restraint of trade is hereby per se illegal, something to that effect. And courts, via the common law process, are extremely good at talking about the reasonable person standard. In other words, what counts as reasonable? What counts as unreasonable? This is something that judges and juries are very, very good at sorting out. And as they develop rulings, those rulings become part of the common law through the process of um, stare decisis, which basically just means let the decision stand. The courts have one rule, really, and that's stay consistent. If mom told you one thing, then she needs to tell uh, the same thing when your brother does the same, you know, makes the same crime. That we need to stay fair, and that means staying consistent with past decisions. If two cases are identical, they should be treated the same. That's how the rule works. And so over time, courts develop a common law based on past decisions. And those past decisions are based around that kind of a uh, loose standard of what would a reasonable person do? Is this reasonable behavior? So uh, over the course of time, the antitrust law in the United States has developed along very different lines than many of the other administrative agencies. The EPA, for instance, or the Department of Education, or the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, all of these agencies have rulemaking authority delegated to them by Congress. In other words, they're in kind of a weird spot where they act as judge, jury, and executioner and lawmaker at the same time, where um, the EPA is given authority by Congress to make rules. And those rules have to stay within the delegated band of authority that they've been given, but that authority can be quite broad. And so they make rules and they have not been elected by anyone. They were given power by an elected body, but then they themselves are not elected and they make rules and those rules are binding on the people of the United States. Now, that's kind of odd. And then they will send inspectors to check and see if you are abiding by these rules that they made. So they are prosecuting the rules, which is the function of the executive branch, theoretically. And they're also making rules, and then also to a certain degree, making judgments about what counts. So kind of acting as all three branches rolled into one due to that delegated legislative authority. But that's not how it works in antitrust law. In antitrust law, you have the executive agencies, specifically the Department of Justice and the Antitrust Division of the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, acting solely as prosecutors. They are in the business of executing the law and nothing else. 
And so what they will do is they will bring cases against people that or companies that they think are violating the, uh, the antitrust laws of the United States, the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act. And they will uh, bring cases through the courts. And if they think the law needs to be kind of nudged in a particular direction, they will bring test cases. They will look for a set of circumstances that match that, that will where the reasonable thing to do would be to bust them. They will bring that through the courts and hope that the court busts them, and then that becomes part of the common law. And I think that this model is incredibly cool. In other words, um, due to an oversight by Congress, the courts have been given the ability to determine what is reasonable behavior. Now, um, I think this would be really cool if it was applied in other places. For the EPA, for example, you could write a very simple law uh, in Congress where it says the EPA shall be a prosecuting branch to prosecute this law, this environmental protection law, and the law will be to that every, that thou shalt not pollute excessively or thou shalt not pollute unreasonably. What counts as unreasonably? That is different if you're in a highly populated area. That's different if you're next to a uh, endangered species. That's different. Uh, that, that means that the EPA is no longer in the business of writing down exhaustive lists of chemicals and how many parts per million is too much. They don't have to determine that ahead of time. Instead, the EPA looks around at situations or private citizens could be empowered to sue under the, this law and unreasonable polluting, as determined by the courts, who are in the business of saying what counts as unreasonable, would develop a federal common law of uh, environmental protection. And that way, uh, it, it, would, it seems much more fair to me, much more uh, customized to the individual circumstances. If you're in the middle of nowhere, and you're in a place where the weather takes care of your externalities, or where the externalities can't hurt anyone or any uh, endangered species, then make your thing, run your factory. And if you're in a place where you're causing harm, then be sued for that harm and repay that. Or be uh, f have an injunction filed against you to stop so you don't cause horrible damage in the next little bit. Courts have a, me a mechanism for that. And what that would do is separate out those hats of legislature, judge, and executioner in a way that would be more fair. And I think it's really interesting that that uh, frame was created by accident. So this is very nerdy. This is a law nerd's take on antitrust law as a different structure for administrative law. I actually wrote my, uh, for my Juris Doctorate, I actually wrote on the subject of Girdle's proof and how it applied to law and why common law with that reasonable person standard is in many cases more just mathematically speaking, than uh, laws made ahead of time by administrative agencies or legislatures. I think there is a place for legislatures and administrative agencies, but I, I think they should be, the administrative agencies should be primarily prosecutors, executors of the law, rather than makers of the law. And you could say that I'm a hypocrite for saying that the judges should be making law, but I don't think that is making law. I subscribe to the idea of Blackstone uh, which is the tradition that all of the Founding Fathers who studied law were trained under, which is this idea that law is discovered by the courts as they clarify the definition of what is reasonable according to the circumstances and their best judgment, and staying within the laws that have been written and the previous cases. It's quite a constrained thing, but uh, it's also inevitable. No matter how clean your code is that you write, you always have questions of, does it count? And that question is always res uh, always responded to or filled out by the courts through the process of common law. So, Legal Nerd's take on antitrust law. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did not, then uh, that gives me some feedback. I would appreciate that. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye.